Acts chapter 10, verses 23 to the end. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. I'm going to pray for Jason before he comes up. Heavenly Father, thank you so much um, that we're able to speak so openly about you and about the amazing things that you've done. Um, I pray for Jason as he comes and uh, speaks to us from your word, that um, you would open our eyes to the amazing things that you can do and that you would um, surprise us with your amazing power and that we wouldn't be limiting you to what we expect you to do. Um, so I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for a reading. You'll need to keep uh, that part of the Bible open. We'll be looking at a little bit more than was read, uh, but uh, I'll keep you updated on where we are in the text as we go through. But let me start with this. One of the most significant people in my journey of faith, bang in the middle of my time at university, was a woman called Kazumi. Now, Kazumi's heritage was... Uh, from Japan, whereas mine was from uh, Britain and the Caribbean. Kazumi was part of the library crew, where I was more part of the clubbing massive. Kazumi was uh, outgoing, and despite my clubbing credentials, I was more uh, of an introvert. But God moved Kazumi towards me to share the gospel. Now, at the time, she wouldn't have known the, the full impact of the conversations we had, but they were life-changing. 
And the significance of this is that Kazumi and my story, as we interacted about the gospel, is not just a one-off story. It's actually a recurring theme in God's plan for the salvation of many. God moves people towards one another, sometimes in unexpected ways, so that they hear the gospel. And it's critical to remember that as we speak this evening of speaking of Christ. Look, the need is more urgent than ever for everyday Christians to speak of Jesus in everyday ways. The Evangelical Alliance uh, did some research recently. They call it Talking Jesus. And that research has shown what I think uh, reveals that Christians are at risk of a kind of monastery mentality. When I went off to go to uh, theological college, I was handed a book called Finding Sanctuary. Uh, and the point of the book was that you're supposed to be able to build retreat and silence into everyday life. Nothing wrong with that at all. But for the people who gave it to me, uh, it was their understanding of what it meant to be a Christian, hiding away in private. And this research, I think, shows that, that this is the kind of direction we seem to be going in. The research showed that 50% of non-Christians do not know a Christian. They don't know anyone who they could call a Christian. 42% of Christians say that the biggest barrier they have to sharing their faith is that they don't know non-Christians well enough. See, it points to a generation of Christians who are singing on Sunday but silent on Monday, monastery mentality. Wonderfully, we've heard some stories even uh, this evening of how that isn't universal. And yet you see the trend. And Christians, of course, in other parts of the world look on this in amazement. One example to hear, who lives in a place called Kazan in Russia. He was converted wonderfully from his Muslim uh, background uh, to Christianity by believers in Latvia. And his heart from that point has been to share the gospel uh, with Muslims. And what saddens and confuses him is the response that he's seeing from Muslims on the one hand, compared with the indifference and fear that he's seeing from Christians on the other. He shared in an interview uh, recently, the world is more willing to receive the gospel than Christians are willing to give the gospel. The world is more willing to receive the gospel than Christians are willing to give the gospel. Monastery mentality. And I don't know about you, but I think we all feel the pinch of that kind of comment. Because none of us is as bold or as consistent or as confident as we would like to be when it comes to speaking of Jesus. And that's why I started with Kazumi's story. Because we need to remember that there's this recurring theme in the way that God deals with his people. God moves people towards one another to hear the gospel, sometimes in unexpected ways. We may not always see the fruit as we do in this passage, but God is doing it. And the big theme in our text today is that God moves Cornelius's heart, a Gentile, to be ready to receive the gospel, and he moves Peter to be the person who shares it with him. Yes, like Peter, we have a part to play. We have a responsibility. But hear this, even as we falter, even as we flounder, we have God working in our midst. Amen? Amen. And so I want us to see through Peter what God does in us to move us out towards those he is already preparing to hear the gospel. What God does in us to move us out towards those who are already prepared to hear the gospel. And so we come to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 is so pivotal in our understanding of mission in the early church. The events of Acts chapter 10 take up more space than any other event in the whole book. Luke retells the, the event several times in different ways because he wants us to know that this is important. And it's all about how the gospel goes out beyond Jerusalem, that was Acts chapter 2, beyond Samaria, that was Acts chapter 8, now to the ends of the earth, to Gentiles, across cultures, to people like you and me. And it highlights what God does in us to move us out towards those he is already preparing to hear the gospel. It's a rich chapter, and we won't be able to go through it verse by verse. But here's the big idea that I want to point us to. God expands his kingdom 
by expanding our horizons. God expands his kingdom by expanding our horizons. A friend of mine, in fact, my best man, phoned me up on his 18th birthday. Up until then, he had been resisting getting glasses, spectacles, uh, all of his life. But finally, aged 18, he got them. He phoned me up. He said, Jason, you wouldn't believe what Bromley High Street looks like. It's amazing. (laughs) You know, there's shops here I never even knew were there. And it's so busy. There are so many people. Now, in one sense, he wasn't missing out on much. Bromley High Street is not much to write home about. (laughs) But in another sense, his experience reflects what God does to Peter because he opened his eyes to see what he hadn't seen before, even to see people that he'd neglected to see. God expands his kingdom by expanding our horizons, and we see that in two ways. First, God expanded Peter's welcome, and secondly, he expanded Peter's witness. He expanded Peter's welcome, and secondly, he expanded Peter's witness. So first, he expands Peter's welcome. Peter realized that he needed to widen his welcome to all kinds of people. Just as Kazumi threw the net wide and invited me to share meals with her friends and shared the gospel with her mouth, so did Peter. And before you switch off and think, well, that's just too obvious, Jason, reflect on two mind-blowing things that have happened up until this point in Acts chapter 10. First point, Peter is a disciple who had heard Jesus declare all foods clean in Mark chapter 7. We'll see that distancing yourself from certain types of food was, was just a way of distancing yourself from certain kinds of people who ate those foods. And Jesus had said that that didn't apply anymore. Peter had heard this before. The second little thing is who this disciple is staying with. Now look with me at Acts chapter 10 and verse 5. So I need you to be with me if you've got a Bible or an electronic device that can show you. Acts chapter 10 and verse 5. If you're there, Acts chapter 10 and verse 5, we read now, uh, angels speaking to uh, Cornelius, now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is Peter, verse 6. He is staying with who? Come on, you can tell me. He's staying with who? Simon the Tanner. Now, a tanner is someone who worked with the skin of dead animals. So it was someone who was always ritually unclean. So you see, Peter is staying long term in his house with someone who is ritually unclean. And yet, somehow, Peter was culturally comfortable around him despite his differences. Hear this. It's not that Peter hasn't heard about the need to widen his welcome before. It's been implied by the best preacher on the planet. And it's not as if he hasn't been trying to put this into practice because he's staying with Simon the Tanner. But it seems like the Lord still has work to do in him. The Lord knows that there are still red lines that he will not cross. Question. Could it be that we've heard of the need to widen our welcome before? Could it be that we are even taking steps to put that into practice, and yet the Lord still has work to do in us and in our churches and in our Christian unions? Could it be that there are still red lines that we are not willing to cross? Could it be that we are more comfortable welcoming a teacher who grew up in a Christian home and has now come back to church after having a baby than we would be a refugee from a Muslim background coming in with her baby? Or or to bring it closer to home, listen to this quote from a columnist in The Scotsman last year. He writes this, Stirling University was a melting pot of students from different backgrounds, with many also like me from working class communities and first to go into university. Conversations were seldom concerned with which school you'd attended or who your parents were. I was more worried about being caught stealing someone's ketchup than I was about being accepted because of my upbringing. But this was in stark contrast to the conversations I had meeting friends of friends at older universities. I often received condescending remarks about being at one of the newer universities and confusion about why I chose to go to Stirling. 
Could it be that that kind of class divide is still prevalent in our contexts? It'd be strange if there were not areas where it fell outside of our cultural comfort zones to be. There certainly are for me. And I say that because it means that expanding our welcome is not just something for Peter, it's something for me and something for you to think about. So stick with me as we look at this passage. And we're going to start in verse 9. Uh, an angel has appeared to Cornelius to tell him to send some people to Peter. Uh, they're on their way, and Peter gets uh, tired. He goes up on the roof to pray, and verse 10, he became hungry, wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven opened, and something like a large sheet, maybe it was a bit like a tablecloth, um, coming down uh, to earth by its four corners, and on it, all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. And a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. This tablecloth has got all kinds of animals on it. And God says, eat. And some of these animals would have been unclean. And Peter, following the cultural and religious upbringing that he's had, won't touch any of it. And it's a parable about people. The food laws in Leviticus 11 were to keep God's people holy and separate from others. But now God is saying that all people can become his people. And Peter summarizes the, the, the conclusion of the debate that happens over the next few verses and flick over to Acts chapter 8 with me. And I'm going to ask you to look down again at Acts chapter 10 and verse 28 uh, to see what it says there. Uh, now Peter is with Cornelius, and he says to him, you are well aware that it is against the law for a, a Jew to associate with or visit a, a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call who? Thank you. Some of you there, I was quickly telling you to turn from one place to another. So verse 28, he said to them, you're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call who? Anyone impure or unclean. Do you see? It's not about animals, it's about people. All people now, says God, are clean, able to access God's blessings by faith. No one's off limits because of their cultural background. And the most fundamental way that Peter can express this is through his welcome of others. Do you see verse 29? When I was sent, I came without raising objection. God expanded Peter's welcome, and it's a pattern that we see throughout these verses. In verse 23, Peter invited the, the men into his house. Well, it was Simon the Tanner's house to be guests. And then Cornelius welcomes him into his home in verses 24 and 25. And Peter accepts that welcome when before he wouldn't, what we just uh, looked at in verse 29. Luke wants us to see that welcome is key, a key context for witness. The opposite of monastery mentality is hospitality. Bottom line, it's not possible to credibly call people to be sisters in Christ if we will not share space with them. It's simply not possible to talk credibly of becoming brothers with someone who you will not break bread with, by which I mean Eat with them, be with them. It says something very profound, doesn't it, when we invite people into our space, our personal space, whether it's time for a chat uh, at the bar or coffee at the cafeteria or a meal at yours or accepting a meal from them. What would it be like? What would it look like for you to expand your welcome? Where would it happen? Who would it be with? And could it start right here at Forum, wouldn't it be great if Stirling and Edinburgh or Kings and South Bank in some small way began to reflect the very thing that we hope our CUs will do and begin to welcome across all kinds of difference, the sorts of difference that that columnist was so hurt by earlier. Why? Because God welcomes us. Just came back from holiday where a fellow believer gave us
keys, the keys to her home, and said, this is yours for as long as you're here. These aren't those keys, otherwise she'd be in trouble. But you get the idea. And opened the fridge and said, help yourself to whatever you'd like while you were here. Why? Because God had welcomed her. Christ left the palace of heaven and came to earth and lived the perfect life, died on the cross so that he could give us a set of keys to his home. In fact, his welcome was so generous that he, he didn't just, as it were, show us the fridge, but he became bread so that we could feast on him. Hallelujah. God expands his kingdom by expanding our horizons. And the first thing we see is that God expanded Peter's welcome. The second thing we see is that God expands Peter's witness. He expanded Peter's witness. And as I said earlier, de declaring all foods clean meant that it wasn't only possible to, to welcome people, it was also possible to witness to them. See, for Peter, that meant Jews should witness to, to Gentiles, but by focusing on Cornelius, Luke goes out of his way to show how broad this welcome and witness should go. See, so, so right at the beginning of this chapter, we, we see that on the one hand, Cornelius is a religious and moral and upstanding citizen. But on the other hand, Cornelius was a, a Roman centurion, one whose role it was to oppress the Jews. It, emotionally, Peter may well have struggled to, to have anything to do with him in one sense, a bit like a, a Ukrainian Christian being asked to host and evangelize a Russian general. And yet Peter's lesson from the Lord, verse 28 again, was that God had shown him not to call anyone impure or unclean, that all people, whether they were religious and respectable on the one hand, or whether their friends or colleagues had been rebels on the other, hurtful to Christians, need to hear the gospel. Let me ask you, which group do you naturally shrink back from sharing with? Is it the respectable ones or the rebels? The, the, the respectable ones, I, I mean, the friends who, who, if you like, fit in but don't follow Christ. Or the rebels, maybe those who are politically the polar opposite of you or people who, who simply you'd struggle to associate with. I think for me, it, it's probably the, the respectable uh, friends you know, those who fit in but, but don't quite follow uh, Jesus. Same sort of school, same sort of background, but little interest in Jesus. Which group is it for you? The respectable ones who kind of fit in but don't follow Jesus or the rebels, those who you find it hard to associate with. I want you to hold whichever group it is in your mind as we come to, to Peter's description of the gospel and within that, two brilliant motivations, two brilliant motivations for my evangelism and for yours, for us to speak of Jesus. The, the, the two motivations I want us to look at are the fact that there is no favoritism in God and that there is no peace without Christ. The first one comes in verse 34, no favoritism in God. Peter begins to speak to this assembled Crowd. And he says in verse 34, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Now, Peter here is not commending some kind of works religion. He's not saying God accepts you if you just do the right thing. He is saying that God accepts all people who are humble enough to, to humble themselves before him. Everyone is welcome at the banquet table of God. The, the nearest I've come to hosting a banquet uh, was probably my wedding reception. And uh, as we planned our wedding reception, we had to make a, a list. And there were two big factors controlling who could come to our wedding uh, reception. I, I guess it was who was closest to us, friends and family-wise, uh, who were our favorites, if you like. And of course, what could we afford? And we had to make some cuts. Not everyone <laughs> made the short list. But when it comes to the invitation 
to God's banquet, he says, no, no, no. When it comes to my wedding banquet, everyone is invited. I want everyone on the list. And we say, really, Lord, everyone? Yes, the orphan and the widow and the prisoner and the stranger and the foreigner and the odd one out and the enemy, everyone. And don't worry about the cost because my son's blood is priceless and it can pay the price for anyone who will come. Bottom line, when it comes to our evangelism, there is a banquet on offer and everyone is invited. Just imagine for a moment that you are planning your own wedding reception and you task a friend to take the invitations to the letterbox. So he's got them in his back pocket and as he, as he walks to the letterbox, he sees some of the people who are invited to come to the wedding and he chats with some of them, but with some of them he thinks, well, I'm not sure how Jeff would get on with Sarah, so maybe we'll hold back on that invitation just for now. And he doesn't give it. And he gets to the, to the letterbox and he's looking through the names and he, he, he puts some of them in the letterbox and some of them he thinks, well, really, will they fit in? Not sure. Puts that back in his back pocket. How would you feel when you found out what he'd done? And how much more the Lord? We've been given invitations for all of those in our universities and in our neighborhoods. And it's the good news that Jesus Christ, in all of his beauty and brilliance, is Lord and has prepared a table for all who will come. What will we do with those invitations? It's the first huge motivation for our evangelism. God shows no favoritism. The second is that there is no peace without Christ. Verse 36. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. In other words, quite simply, without peace, all of us are at war with God. Sunday, April the 29th, 1945, Pamela Weeks writes in her diary that she arrived at work to see people crowded around uh, the radio. And as she listened to what was going on on the radio, there was the voice of Winston Churchill saying that the war was over. And she wrote in her diary, my first reaction was wild, uncontrollable joy. I galloped like a mad thing around the office. I flung my arms around Gordon, who presumably was someone in the office. And... <laughs> Pamela had woken up each day knowing that she was in grave danger. She'd woken up each day, presumably for years, knowing that all of those around her were in grave danger. And yet now, on that glorious day, the danger was gone. And the problem for us, the problem for us is that often we don't feel like there is danger. Often we, we live, don't we, like those around us are not in danger. And so we miss the joy of sharing the good news that a peace agreement is possible. Think for a moment, who are the non-Christians who you see on an average day or week or month? Perhaps those who you subconsciously have written off as candidates for Christianity. Maybe we do try and be kind and care for them. Maybe we show them some degree of welcome, but do we confess our king to them? Perhaps it's the Somali student next door who is at war with God. Perhaps it's the super wealthy student who seems to have it all together, but who's at war with God. Perhaps it's the family member who wishes you well on the way to uni at the beginning of every term who's at war with God. Perhaps it's the really nice student whose life sometimes feels more morally on board with God's than yours does. All need to hear that the danger has been turned away when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that, as we read in verse 43, near the end of our passage, everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And it's when we do that that the presence of God is poured out into our lives. Hallelujah. Do you see the point? Let us not forget the seriousness of our situation without Jesus Christ, that naturally speaking, we are at war. Do you see that God expanded 
Peter's witness. And we see these motivations in the uh, words that he uses. No favorites and no peace without Christ. Now look, in, in terms of what we actually say, how apt it must have been for the centurion to hear him say, to hear Peter say, that there was peace with the Lord. This is a man who'd spent his life fighting for peace in the Roman Empire on behalf of a Lord whose name was Caesar. Cornelius's Lord could only offer a fragile, oppressive peace. I can just picture Russell Crowe in those opening scenes of Gladiator where there are bodies everywhere. He can only offer that kind of fragile peace. But there is a Lord who has made peace, not by killing, but by being killed. And his name is Jesus. So you see, he, he contextualizes his message a bit, as we've heard it a little bit tonight. He, he thinks, how can I put this in the best way for the people who are hearing it? But I, I'm actually most encouraged by the simplicity of his message in these verses. In verse 38, Jesus did good and healed. Verse 39, they, they killed him uh, on a cross. Verse 40, he rose on the third day. Verse 41, he was seen by the apostles who testified to him. And verse 43, forgiveness is available. And for me, that's just an encouragement not to overcomplicate our witness. I recently realized that I was um, at an event at our church that happens once a month and a number of non-Christians come and uh, one of the guys who comes along was there. And, and week by week or month by month, I've been chatting to him and thinking, well, how do I put things in just the right way that it will uh, speak into his life? And most of the time, I found that I was actually ending up not really saying very much at all. And so this particular week, I just, I just said, look, can we just stop the conversation? I, I just want to say, look, I love you. I don't think I've said in a while that actually, you know, there is this God. I just want to remind you there's this God and he loves you. But there is this problem that we've turned our backs on him. And he sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross so that we could be forgiven, so that uh, that problem of forgiveness could be removed. And you can have that if you put your trust in him. And he carried on drinking his tea and did absolutely nothing. But, uh, but I said it to him, and he didn't, he didn't shout at me, he didn't get angry. But there was a simplicity in just saying he needed to hear that message. And it's plainly set out. And he did that, and he heard it. See, God expands his kingdom by expanding our horizons. And firstly, he expanded Peter's welcome, helped him to put the glasses on so that he could see all people made in God's image worthy of receiving uh, that truth. And secondly, he expanded his witness. He reminded him that all people uh, should be invited to the banquet. Now, look, I don't remember a word that Kazumi actually said to me. What I remember is that she cared about Jesus and she cared enough about me to say something, someone who was way outside of her comfort zone. And God had already been working in me to make me ready to receive what she had to say. So, so friends, be encouraged. As you prepare to welcome and to witness, it's not all about us. We try to persuade but it's not our persuasion that convicts. We try to answer, but it's not ultimately our answers that will convince. We try to speak clearly, but it's the Spirit who will ultimately make God's word clear as the Lord lovingly and patiently persists with all of those who he calls. He did it with Peter. He did it with Cornelius. And he'll do it with us as we keep seeking to follow him faithfully. I'm going to give us a moment to reflect. Take a few seconds just to think about what we've uh, heard, how the Lord expands his kingdom by expanding our horizons, our horizons of welcome, our horizons of witness. As we do that, uh, after we've done that, I'm going to, I'm going to pray.
Lord, we are tempted to turn our backs on our neighbours, thinking we're something greater. Their sins are nothing like our own. So we praise you and bless you that Jesus came to our rescue. Despite our sin, yes, he came to give us new hearts to see. That, that a fatal collision with you has been turned to a mission. Forgiveness won through crucifixion, declared by the risen son. So help us see just like you do. No distinctions between two. So we hold out your word to a world so in need. Would we welcome with wonder, seeing Christ in our brothers, offering hope to all others with your spirit leading? For the table is set now, and you are drawing your guests now. So help us share your request now to bring them to the feast. Amen.